pleasant a pleasant day to everyone once more this is dr ariel demon lusok director of the admrc so first and foremost i would like to thank all the subscribers who subscribe my channel it is a heartwarming that uh, responses that uh, in just a short period of time uh, a lot of people are responding and uh, subscribing to my channel now before we go further to the other chapters of the criminal law book two uh, i i made a decision to discuss first the book one more or first because this is the fundamentals okay so the book one of the revised penal code is actually composed of five titles but before the, the five five titles will be discussed we should have first discuss some preliminary matters basic rules governing the rule of criminal law understanding book one will be a great help for for us to understand easily the book two okay so i will be discussing now the fundamentals of criminal law Okay, which is subdivided basically into three parts. For easy memorization, I have crafted here again an acronym, which is PGT. No, that's not that, that it does not stand for Filipinas Got Talent, huh? PGT stands for Prospectivity, Generality, and Territoriality. So let's begin with generality because that's the very basic rule no, of our criminal law. What is generality? Simply, criminal law is binding upon all persons who live or sojourn in the Philippine archipelago. Sorry for the error. Mukhang may kulang na letter A. Archipelago. So archipelago uh, means... Uh, it's, it's just a description here, okay? The main subject here is the person, not the archipelago. So that's one thing that I always emphasize with. When you analyze a question, you have to focus on what is the issue, not the descriptions or other factors maybe. Pero somehow, you can consider that if you are talking about other specific rules of the criminal law, okay? So if the issue is to whom the law shall be enforced or who shall abide by our criminal law, that is the question of generality, okay? Persons, all persons. So I don't care whether you are Filipino, Chinese, Japanese, Panis, or Spanish, okay? Basta, you reside in the Philippines, you are obligatory to follow the criminal law of the Philippines. You violate it, then you will be sanctioned accordingly, applying the principle of due process, okay? The second fundamental principle is territoriality. Okay. What we're discussing right now is only the general rule, okay? Because that is also one principle that you should not forget. In studying law, you should start with the general rule, okay? You don't go to the exemption unless you clearly understand what the general law speaks of, okay? So what is the second one? Territoriality. It is defined as what? The principle of criminal law which states that criminal law is enforceable within the Philippine Terry story so what does it mean so even if it is a vessel or planes okay of other foreign countries if their airplanes their vessels are in the philippines then philippine law shall be applied not their law simply because of territoriality they are in the philippine territory so the philippine law shall be the one that is enforceable so what is the main issue here the issue is where so if the question is about the principle of place where the crime was committed, then the, 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 the rule that we applied in general is territoriality. And the Philippines follow the rule of territoriality because we adopted the English rule on the international law of territory. Okay? Wherein the territoriality is the priority, not necessarily the nationality. Okay? The third one is prospectivity. And what is prospective? Prospective simply means that the criminal law shall only be applied to those acts which, at the time of their commission, there is already an existing law that punishes such an act. So what does it mean? For a short description, prospective means the law must be forward and not backward. What does it mean? So, dapat mauna yung law bago yung violation because there can be no violation without a law. Okay? The other principles behind that is the Latin maxim nullum crimen, nullum nulla puena sinilege which means there is no crime without a law 
punishing such an act. So therefore, prospectivity answers the question of what? When? When the law shall be applied? And the answer is very simple. It can only be applied to those acts which are committed at the time the law is already effective. Okay? So that those are the general rules. Okay? After knowing the general rules, let's have an application first before we go to the exemption for a better understanding. Okay, example, let's have a, an application of the three principles. Mr. Izuzu is a Japanese tourist. He went to Philippines and committed a crime of theft. Where should he be charged? Okay, so again, the issue here is where did he commit or who he is? Okay, he is a, China, a Japanese tourist, okay, but he is in the Philippines. So, what should be the, the consequence? The consequence is definitely he will be charged in the Philippines. Why? Because applying the principle of generality, even if you are a foreigner or an alien, no, not a resident evil, no? If you are a foreigner or an alien, regardless of that status, as long as you are living here, you commit a crime here, you are liable to the Republic of the Philippines. Okay. Next example. Shaman Airline crash in the Naia Terminal 1, causing great damages to the runway and delayed in the in a number of flights. Okay? What is the consequence? So now it's not about a person, it's about an aircraft. An aircraft of foreign nature. But where did it land and crash? It crashed in the Philippine Terry. So what will be the consequence? The consequence is the owner of the shaman airline will be held responsible to the Philippines since the event took place within the Philippine territory. So this is a clear application of what? The principle of territory reality. Even though the airlines belong to a foreign ownership, but the fact that it causes damage to the Philippine territory, to the Filipino people, people, then they are liable to the Philippine law. So therefore, Philippine law, not the foreign law, will be applied simply because their airline is already in our territory. Third, Mr. Yan committed loitering along CM Recto on February 12, 2020. March 15, a city ordinance was passed prohibiting loitering along the streets of Recto and Quiapo. Can Mr. Yan be held liable? Now look at the scenario. The act was done Feb 12. The ordinance only came March 15. Can Mr. Yan be held liable? Think. Okay, so I think you already know the answer. The answer is very obvious. He cannot be charged criminally for loitering. For what reason? Because his act was done before the passage of the city ordinance. This is the clear and simple application of the principle of prospective or what we call retrospectivity. Okay? That the law shall be forward and not backward. So I hope the general rule is clear before we go on to the exemptions. Now, let's have the exemptions. In generality, it calls for three exemptions. The first exemption is treaty stipulation or in other words, kasunduan. Kapag may kasunduan, if there is a treaty between countries or between and among countries, okay, and it is signed by their, by their legal authority, state representatives, that Kasunduan or treaty must be respected by the signatories to that treaty. A good example of that is the U.S. and military, uh, Philippines military exercises. So, yung tinawag natin balikatan program before. No? Na, uh, one of the provisions of that agreement is that if a military soldier of the U.S. commits a crime and it is committed within the military exercises area, it, he or she will not be held liable to the Philippines. He will be accountable to the United States of America. So that is an example of an exemption to generality. And it can also be an exemption to territory reality. Why? 
Now look, he is a foreigner, not a Filipino. But he is in the Philippines. Okay. So, sabi natin sa generality, regardless of your race, gender, regardless of your nationality, once you commit a crime in the Philippines, you are bound by the Philippine law. But there is an agreement, we have to respect the agreement. Yun po yung tinatawag na treaty stipulation. So again, treaty stipulation is an exemption that can be applied both to principle of generality and territoriality. Another is public international law. Okay. Actually, a public international law is more of an agreement in the international arena. Okay. If a member country, for example, of United Nations, we are a member of that or the international organization, there is a law or there is an agreement that is set by that international law or organization. And our president or representative signed to that, we are bound by that law. Okay. And particularly with respect to criminal law, public international law provides that the head of every state shall be what immune from criminal charges for a simple reason that each country are independent or sovereign. That's the principle of public international law. So therefore, under the public international law, sino sino who are given an immunity? The first is definitely the head of the states, ang pinuno ng bawat bansa. So just to make a clarification, hindi lang po presidente ang head of states. The head of states depends on the forms of government that they have. Like for example, in other countries, exercising aristocracy, they have the king. Okay, Somehow they have the prince, the queen, so those are the rulers of their country. Okay? In Vatican, which is also the, the, a state, the head is the Pope. Okay? In some country, they have the prime minister, you know, if they have the parliamentary system of government. In some, they have emperor, like in China. Okay? They have sultan, emir. This is practiced usually in Islamic country. They have grand duke and prince in other country as well. So these are only some of the titles accorded to head of the state. So if a president of another country went to the Philippines and he commits shoplifting, for example, can we charge him in the Philippines? Answer is no. Why? Because of the principle of public international law, which is one of the exemption to the generality rule. Okay. Who else are given immunity? Ambassadors, ministers, charges the affairs, and ministers of plenipotentiary. Okay. You might be asking ambassadors who are they? They are the diplomatic representative of a country to an allied country. So like for example, US and Philippines, we are friends. So we have ambassador in the United States in the same way that America has an ambassador in the Philippines. So if their ambassadors commit a crime in other other countries, of allied nature, then they cannot be charged in the other country. They will be held liable or responsible to their country that they are representing. Okay? Now, what about ministers? Many are asking, do we have a minister in the Philippines? The answer is yes. But we are no longer calling them minister. Before they are called minister, when we have the structure of ministry of health, ministry of justice. But, uh, at the time of uh, the former president or the late president, Corazon Cuanco Aquino, we adopted the U.S. structure, which is, we changed the ministry to department. That's why we have Department of Justice, Department of Health, Department of so on and so forth. So these departments now is headed not by minister. They are now headed by secretaries. So the equivalent of ministers in other country to our country is what? Secretaries. So yung mga cabinet secretaries po, they are also given immunity by reason of public international law and because of the fact that they are the alter ego of our president. Okay, the third exemption, I, by the way, consul and vice consul are not exempted no? unless they only commit a breach of performance of their function and it is committed within their consular offices, then they will be responsible to United States of America or to the country that they are representing. The third one is the law on preferential applications. So this one from the word self preferential, this is a kind of an exemption that gives only exemption to a specific 
situations. And a good example of this is our parliamentary immunity provided in our constitution, particularly under Article 6 under the legislative po, Congress. So yung mga congressmen po natin at senators, they are enjoying parliamentary immunity. Ano po yun? Dalawa po yun. Basically, one, they cannot be sued for libel or defamation if they utter or they publish articles in the performance of their legislative functions. Okay? That is one. The second one is the immunity from arrest. Okay? So, if any members of the Congress, whether congressman or senator, they commit minor offenses, and the minor offense is only punishable somehow up to a prison correctional, okay? They are not supposed to be arrested. Especially if they are going to attend or they are attending session, whether regular session or a special session in the Congress. Okay, that is the parliamentary immunity. It is only applied when the action is done in the in the legislative function. Second, if it is they are in the actual performance of their functions. And take note, the immunity for arrests is only for light and less grave offenses, up to prison correctional offense. Once the crime they committed is punishable by prison mayor and above, there is no parliamentary immunity, especially if, they, if there is a warrant of arrest issued by the court. They can be arrested even if the Congress is in session. Okay. Now, what about this Republic Act 75? The RA-75 actually is a, some sort of uh, a response of the Philippines to the international agreement. This pertains to the uh, members of the retinue of the ambassadors or the head of the states. So, for example, ambassador of U.S. went to the Philippines. He brought with him is the member of his retinue. For example, kasama niya yung kanyang dakilang assistant. The assistance of the ambassador can also be given immunity, but the ambassador of U.S. must submit their name to the Department of Foreign Affairs so that the FA will issue a certificate of immunity. So it is an, as a concept of extension of the privilege no, to the members of the retinue of the ambassador presidents or those given immunity. And in return, if our president went to U.S. and he brings with him member of his retinue, they can also be exempted from the law of the U.S. So this is just a matter of reciprocal uh, recognition of law. Okay? Now, let's talk about the exemption to territoriality. Actually, the exemption to territoriality is also the exemption to generality. Ano po yun? Yung principles of international law, yung treaty stipulation, and the law on preferential application. Okay? But, but, our revised penal code, specifically under Article 2, provide for an extra territorial jurisdiction of the country. So, what do you mean by extra? Extra is outside, no? So, it means to say there are cases that even if the crime is committed outside of the Philippine jurisdiction, our law can or might still be applied. Okay? And what are those uh, extra territorial jurisdiction. Our Article 2, Paragraph A1 or A to E are enumerated. So there are there are five extra territorial jurisdictions. So we are now talking about an extension of territory. The first one is should commit a crime while the offense is in what committed in the Philippine airship or Philippine ship. Okay. Second, should forge or counterfeit any coin or currency note of the Philippine island or obligations and securities issued by the government of the Philippines. So these are the money, okay, bank trans, uh, what they call this, any treasury bank notes that is issued by the government or any document that is accountable. The government may be held responsible or accountable with it. If you forge them, even if you did it outside the country, you can be held liable. Okay. Number three, should be liable for acts connected with the introduction to this country or island of any obligation. This is just an opposite of, uh, no, no, an addition to paragraph two. In paragraph two, you did it outside the Philippines. This one, you did it outside, but you bring it in our jurisdiction. Like, for example, you counterfeit a money and that money is brought to the Philippines, then definitely you are accountable to the Philippines. Okay? 
Four, while being a public officer or employee, should commit an offense in the exercise of their function. So this is the example, as I have said. For example, our ambassador commits a crime in United States. So he cannot be held liable in United States because of public international law. But definitely, as a public officer of the Philippines, he is accountable to the Republic of the Philippines. So therefore, he can be charged, not in U.S., but in the Philippines. For a simple reason that he is our public officer and he commits a crime in the performance of his official function. Take note of the connotation in the exercise of their official function. Okay? So if the crime committed by a Filipino abroad okay, is not connected to his official function as a government official, then he can never be held liable to the Philippines. His responsibilities and liabilities will be to the other countries where he committed the crime. And last but not the least, if you commit any of the crimes enumerated under the Title I of the Book Two, which is the Crimes Against National Security and Law of Nations, which are enumerated from Article 114 to Article 123 of the Book Two of the Revised Penal Code. So let's discuss them one at at time for a more elaborated discussion. Okay, Philippine ship and airship rule. Now, what's the rule? Now, I give you a short outline for easy understanding. Again, what is that? First, what kind of ship is involved or what kind of airship? If the ship or airship is a warship, then Ops of limits po tayo dyan, no? For example, very simple question. Yung battleship ng US sumadsad sa Philippine territory na sira ang other coral reefs. Can we arrest and charge them? No. Why? Because we are dealing with warship. The warship will be held accounted to the country of origin. So since US warship siya, US warship pa rin ang may obligasyon dyan. But we can file an action for demand of damages. And that's actually happens in our history where the U.S. pay for the damages of our coral reef because of the damages caused by their warship. Now, the more complicated issue is if it is a commercial ship or also known as merchant vessel or airplane. So those ships or vessels or airplane used for commercial purposes, okay? Like those who are transporting and importing what? People and goods, okay? So the next issue, if it is a commercial vessel, is where the vessel is registered. If the vessel is registered in the Philippines, then Philippine has jurisdiction. If it is in the Philippine territory, alin dito yung extraterritoriality? If it is in the high seas. So high seas, also known as international water, ito po yung bahagi ng karagatan na hindi po pag-aari ng anumang bansa. So kapag yung ating vessel po ay nandoon at may nangyaring krimen, tayo pa rin po ang may jurisdiction. Yun po yung extraterritoriality principle of our criminal law under paragraph 1. Now, if our vessel is already in another country, then we have to respect the law of that country whether they apply the English rule or the French rule. So if that country adopted the French rule, they will honor nationality, pwede nilang ibigay sa atin yung jurisdiction kasi yun po ang priority ng French rule. Pero kung ang gamit nila English rule, malaki ang possibility na wala tayong karapatan over the case because they will simply say this is our jurisdiction in the same way that it is the one practiced in the Pili, in the Philippines. Okay. But there can be a cases of renvoi. Ano po yung renvoi? For example, yung pinuntahang bansa, ang gamit nila French rule. So, sasabihin nila, sa'yo na lang yung kaso, kayo na, total barko nyo yan. Pero kung yung bansa naman na pinagmulan, gamit nila yung English rule, they may say, kayo na, kasi teritoryo nyo yan. So, in that case, if renvoi or referring back happen, in our case, the Supreme Court held, if they refer it back to the Philippines, then the Philippines will take cognizance of the case. Okay? I hope that's clear. This is the summary about the French rule and the English rule that we apply when it comes to airship or a vessel. Okay? So as I said, French rule follow the flag or nationality. That's why you notice international airplane and vessel carries the flag where it was registered. Purpose for identification. 
Okay? So, general rule is uh, if the crime committed in the vessel okay, happens to be done or occurred in another territory and they follow the French rule, they might return the jurisdiction to the country of origin kung saan siya nakaristro. Yun po ang French rule. Ang exemption dito, kapag yung nangyaring crime sa vessel affects their national security, safety, then they might say, kami ang hawak ng kaso because it affects our national security. Now, what about the English rule? The English rule prioritizes the situs or the place or the territory. In the Latin word, that is situs, no? Lugar. So, yan ang gamit ng Pilipinas. So, we said, even if it is a foreign vessel, if it is already in the Philippine port, a crime was committed or it is in the Philippine water, Philippines po ang may jurisdiction because we follow the English rule. Okay? Pero may exemption po. If the crime is only a minor offenses, like for example, a member of cruise ship commits an injuries or physical injuries to one another, it is done inside the vessel and no Filipinos are affected, we might say, kayo na lang, you handle the case anyway, they are your citizen and we are not affected by what happened. Okay? So that is the exemption to the English rule. Now that's the beauty of criminal law. There is always a general rule, there is an exemption to the rule, and there are exemptions to the Exemption. And extraterritorial jurisdiction of the country is about forgery. Ito po yung sa paragraph 2 and paragraph 3 kanina. Na kapag yung pera ng Pilipinas or anything that the, the Philippines can be obligated for or a security that can be responsibility of our country, even if it is committed outside the country or it is done in other country but brought in our country, our law shall be applicable. Ganun lang po kasimple yung paragraph 2 and paragraph 3. Now, let's go to paragraph 4. What about with public officer? Actually, I shortly discussed this a while ago. That if you are a public officer, even if you go to other countries, if you commit a crime in the performance of your duty, your accountability is not in that country, but in the Republic of the Philippines. So this is more specifically applicable only to those crimes that are committed by public officer in the performance of their what uh, public functions. Okay, and actually it is enumerated under the Title Seven of the Book Two: Crimes Committed by Public Officer, such as bribery, corruptions. Okay, graph and corruptions, the special law, the case of uh, plunder, okay, malversation of funds. So if you commit this and you're a public officer, even if you go to abroad or you did it outside of the country, but it is in the performance of your function, you are accountable to the Republic of the Philippines. Okay, lumalabas din po yan sa board exam. Lastly, is those crimes against national security and law of nations, where are, there are 10 articles enumerated in the book one. So, yun po yung uh, Article 114, treason. Article 115, conspiracy and proposal to commit treason. Article 116, misprison of treason. Article 117, which is espionage. Article 118, yung giving reprisal or motive for reprisal. And uh, Article 119, uh, meron po tayong crimes of correspondence to enemy country. And flight to enemy country okay, is another crime. And we also have a crime of violation of neutrality. That's also included in the Title 1. And uh, the, the last two is the piracy mutiny and the qualified piracy. Now, we might also include here a crime under the special law, which is the piracy, uh, the anti-hijacking law. Uh, which is encompasses in the Republic Act uh, 6235, the law inimical to our aviation securities. Okay? So, yan lang po. Yung mga crime, if they are committed even outside of the Philippine jurisdiction, Philippines has what? Jurisdiction. But, take note, hindi po kasama ang mga crimes like rebellion, kudita, sedition. Why? Because these are not crimes against national security actually. In the revised, they are classified as crimes against public order. Nasa Title 3 po yan. So, hindi po siya kasama sa exemption under the paragraph 5. Okay? So, yung naka-highlight po ng white, yun po yung mga specific crimes against national security and law of nation. The blue ones, they are not covered by the title. 
Okay? What are the limitations of our criminal law? Our criminal law has a lot of limitations enumerated in the Constitution. The very basic is the equal protection of the law because that is mandated by the Constitution that no person or class of person shall be deprived of the same protection of law which is enjoyed by the other persons or other classes in the same place and in the same circumstances. Now, this is a response to the concept of generality. So, the law shall be applied to all equally Okay? regardless of race, genders, and others. Although we know that there are exemptions to uh, general rule. Okay? Another is the due process of law. Very specific under Article 3, Bill of Rights, Section 1. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. Neither should anyone be denied of the equal protection of law. So number 1 and number 2, Roman numeral 2, are actually discussed in the Section 1 of Article 3 of the Constitution of the Philippines, the Bill of Rights. Okay? So hindi po pwede arrestado ka, then you are automatically sentenced. There must be a due process. And the principle of due process means that there must be due notice, there must be a due opportunity for everyone to explain their sides, to be heard before they can be what uh, adjudicated properly by a competent authorities. Is that no imposition of very cruel and unusual punishment. So what will be the rule? If in case uh, there is a crime charge and the court thinks that the penalty is so severe that it is not practical or it is not reasonable, then the judge uh, must make the proper decision. He must follow according to the law. But he can make a recommendation to the office of the president through the Department of Justice that the said case should be given a certain uh, exemption and that for which the president may exercise his power to pardon or he may even use the power of amnesty with the concurrence of the Congress. And that provision is actually can be found in the provision of Article 5 of the Book 1 of the Revised Penal Code. Okay? Another limitation, no ex post facto law or bill of attainder. Nasa last article po yan, or last section ng Article 3 ng Bill of Rights, Section 22. Ano pong pinagkaiba? Very simple. The ex post facto law is the opposite of prospectivity rule. Kapag po yung bagong batas ay hindi po pabor sa isang akusado at ito'y ating in sa kanya, that is considered an ex post facto law. Okay? Hindi ko sinabing in facto yung batas na ito, pero that connotes illegal. No? Facto connotes an illegal. So this is an illegal law. Okay? So malawak po ang ex post facto law, meron po siyang tatlong nature, mamaya explain natin. Yung bill of attainder naman, paborito din sa exam yan. Ito po yung sinabi na natin kanina, kailangan namang due process of law. Hindi po po pwedeng gagawa ng batas ang Congress na kapag yung tao ay nag-violate, automatic he will be punished without due process of law. Yun po yung pinagbabawal na bill of attainder. Ang batas na magpaparusa without a trial. Okay? nature of an ex post facto law. One, when the new law punish an act not so punishable. So, ibig sabihin, nauna yung act, bago yung batas, hindi natin pwedeng i-apply yung bagong batas sa bagay na nauna ng ginawa. Okay? So, pag in-apply po natin yan, yan ay considered as an ex post facto law. Another, when the new law provides for greater punishment, kung yung krimen ay dati ng krimen, may dati ng batas. There is already a penalty and there is a new law passed by the Congress and provides for greater penalty. Can we apply it to the person? No. Because the penalty should be imposed, should be the penalty imposable during the time that he commits the crime. Okay? Not during the time that he is already on trial, not during the time that he is already serving his sentence. Especially if the new penalty is higher than the old law. Okay? But, but there is an exemption here. 
If the new law is favorable to the accused, then that new law can be given retroactive effect. That's provided by the provision of Article 22 of the Book 1. But take note, it can only be given retroactive it is favorable. So, ibig sabihin, mas magaan yung bagong penalty kesa sa lumang penalty. Pwede po natin siyang bigyan ng retroactive effect. But meron pong limitation yon. Hindi po siya dapat, he should not be habitual delinquent. Okay? The definition of habitual delinquent can be found in section Article 62, Paragraph 5 of the Revised Penal Code, Book 1. And the third nature of ex post facto law is the new law provides for lesser degree of proof. It cannot be applied to the accused. Okay? For every crime, there is a degree or quantum of proof required. And in criminal case, we require proof beyond reasonable doubt. So if a new law passed requiring a lesser degree of evidence, it cannot be applied to an act previously done because that will violate the principle of prospectivity. And if we did that, it becomes an ex post facto law. Okay, so that's it for the fundamental principles of the criminal law. Thank you and God bless. Again, it is my honor and privilege to be of help. Please follow this video presentation because this is a series of presentation that will cover the book one. Now, this is only the preliminary part. Then there will be part one, part two, up to part uh, 12, Sigurian or 15. Okay. Although, if you look at the book one, the book one is only subdivided into five titles. No? From title one to title five. And it is from article one to article 113. Once more, many thanks to all those who have already subscribed my video channel. It was a great and heartwarming responses. Hope to see you again. Please subscribe and follow my succeeding video. Thank you and God bless us all. Okay, criminal law. Criminal law is basically defined as the branch of public law or municipal law which defines crimes, lists of their nature, and provides for their punishment. It may also be defined as uh, a branch of municipal law that uh, provides for what are the acts or remission that is in violation of the public law and provides for their natures and their classifications as well as their punishment. And usually when we speak of punishment, it's either a fine or an imprisonment or a combination of both. Now, uh, I made here a simple description of the nature of what a criminal law is. Okay, So criminal law is a public law. Why? Because the criminal law binds all the people who live and sojourn in the Philippines archipelago. So, it is not catering only to a specific group of people. It is applies to all people who live in our territory. Second, it is mandatory law. Why? Because it sets for certain rules and regulations that are obligatory in nature. What does it mean? It means these are the things that you should do and you should not do. Otherwise, doing what is not supposed to be done or not doing what is ought to be done will be sanctioned by the criminal law. Third, it is substantive law. Why criminal law is substantive? Because it is a law that provides for the creation of rights and obligations. Okay? And if you look at criminal law, it is more actually of rights, uh, more of an obligations. No, The obligations of the people, to individual and also the obligations of the public to the individual. Okay. Fourth, it is prohibitory law because it provides for acts or acts that are not supposed to be done. Okay. So it prohibits a certain acts uh, which is considered a violation of the human rights or the other way around, it provides for acts that regulates human rights. Acts, no? We all have human acts, uh, human rights rather, but our human rights should be regulated in order to uh, give justice and equity to ev every individual. Okay? And lastly, it is a penal law. Why? Because it provides for a punishment. Okay? Actually, that is one of the most essential elements of what a criminal law is. There must be a punishment because without punishment, it cannot be considered as a criminal law. 
Okay? Now, aside from these uh, five items that I have enumerated, our criminal law is also specific, no? It's specific in a sense that it provides for a specific element for a specific crimes. And the absence of one element might constitutes a violation of other provisions of the law and not that specific title or specific crimes. Okay? Now, let's move on to the principles, the fundamental principles.